Hello everybody and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about redox reactions. And in this video we will look in more detail at the two types of reaction called reduction and oxidation. We will then move on to a new type of equation called ionic equations. And we'll finish the video by looking at some examples of redox reactions, for instance displacement reactions and the reactions of metals with acids. What I should say before we really start, though, is that this material is for the higher tier of GCSE only in most cases. So certainly for AQA, which is the one that I know the best, this is only for higher tier. So you won't need this video if you know for absolutely certain that you're doing the foundation tier for your GCSE chemistry. I want to begin this video by revisiting two definitions that we explored in an earlier video. And those definitions are oxidation and reduction. Now oxidation, which we encountered in the context of burning metals to make metal oxides, is taken to be the gain of oxygen. And reduction that we encountered in terms of taking oxygen away in metal extraction is taken to be the loss of oxygen. But these aren't the only definitions for oxidation and reduction. Oxidation has a second meaning, and that is as a loss of electrons. And reduction also has a second meaning, which is the gain of electrons. Now, I know it's confusing because there's two definitions for the same word, but it is nice in one respect in that oxidation and reduction are opposites for whichever situation you're talking about, whether you're talking about oxygen or whether you're talking about electrons, oxidation and reduction mean the exact opposite thing. Now the gain of oxygen being oxidation is probably quite obvious and once you know that you'll know that reduction is therefore going to be the opposite. But electrons are less obvious and helpfully there is an acronym to help you remember which is which and that acronym is oil rig which stands for oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. So that makes things a lot easier if you can remember the acronym oil rig for the electron definitions. It's perhaps not immediately obvious but if one substance is losing oxygen then something else must be gaining it. That oxygen has to be going somewhere. So if one substance is being reduced in a reduction reaction then something else must be being oxidized. And we can see that from a particle diagram down here. If we consider the element on the left hand side to be copper and the element on the right hand side to be carbon and the blue particle is going to be oxygen, if the carbon comes along and takes the oxygen away from the copper we can say that the copper has now been reduced because it has lost the oxygen and the carbon has been oxidized because it has gained oxygen. Now because they have both happened at the same time, they've both happened simultaneously, we use the term redox because that is a, a portmanteau, that's a combination of the words oxidation and reduction. We've taken the red part of reduction and the ox part of oxidation and we've combined them to make one phrase redox or redox is how we normally pronounce it and this happens when oxygen is lost or gained but it also happens when electrons are lost and gained at the same time too because if one substance is losing electrons another substance must be gaining them because electrons are far too small and reactive to exist by themselves so in redox reactions oxygen is lost and gained at the same time by two different elements and Electrons can also be lost and gained at the same time by two different elements. The first type of redox reaction that we're going to look at in more detail is a displacement reaction. Now remember, in a displacement reaction, a more reactive element is able to take the place of a less reactive element in a compound. This is normally reserved for metals displacing other metals, but as we saw in carbon reduction, it can be carbon that displaces a less reactive metal. 
So for instance, if you were to place the metal zinc into a solution of copper sulfate, the more reactive zinc displaces the less reactive copper from the solution. And so the zinc turns into zinc sulfate and the copper sulfate turns into copper by itself. And if we were to write symbol equations for this, we've got zinc solid reacting with copper sulfate solution. So AQ is turning into zinc sulfate solution. So again, we need an AQ and we need Cu because we're going to produce solid copper. Now, we need to take a look at what's happening here in terms of redox. In order to do this, let's look at the two compounds. Now, you maybe don't remember this one, but copper, when it combines with sulfate, the copper is a metal and the sulfate is non-metals. And so this is going to be ionic. And the copper ion is a two plus ion. And the sulfate ion is a two minus ion. But we don't care so much about the sulfate. What we're looking at here is the copper because the copper begins in the reactants as a two plus ion and finishes at the end with no charge at all. There's nothing written here. So copper has got no charge, which means that copper at the end is copper zero. And so since electrons are negatively charged, if the copper starts the reaction being positively charged and finishes the reaction having no charge overall, must have gained electrons to do this. And we can show this by considering the copper in what's called a half equation, where we look at half the picture because we are only looking at the element copper. So copper begins as a two plus ion and it gains electrons to become copper zero. In other words, it doesn't have any charge. Now this process is obviously reduction because reduction is the gain of electrons. Now, just like ordinary equations, these half equations need to be balanced as well. And the thing that we need to balance here is the electrons because we've got copper on the left hand side and we've got copper on the right hand side. But the right hand side has no charge because this copper is neutral. But on the left hand side, this copper is two plus and an electron is negatively charged. And so what we need to balance this half equation is a two here because that gives us two electrons. So two minus and two plus cancels out overall to be neutral. And so what this is showing us is that the copper two plus ion from copper sulfate is gaining two electrons to become neutral copper. And then if we consider the zinc in zinc sulfate, the zinc ion is going to be Zn2+. And at the beginning, the zinc is neutral. It has got no charge. And so to write a half equation for the zinc, the zinc began as zinc zero and it finished as zinc two plus. So it has lost two negative electrons and we need to show them on the right hand side of this equation down here. And this loss of electrons is oxidation. So the copper has gained two electrons to become copper zero and the zinc has lost two electrons to become zinc two plus. So it has been oxidized. So reduction and oxidation have happened at the same time to two different elements, and this is a redox reaction. Now you'll remember just on the previous page that I said we weren't too interested in the sulfate ion for this equation. And the reason is that it actually doesn't take part in the reaction because it's there at the beginning and it's there at the end. So it doesn't really react. And so we're going to look now at a new type of equation called ionic equations, and they only show the particles that are involved in the actual reaction. And the other types of particle which aren't involved in the reaction, they aren't reduced or oxidized, they are left out. And we actually call them spectator ions because they just sit there and don't do anything and sort of watch the rest of the reaction happen. So if we return back to the original equation that we had on the previous page, we can see that we have got two substances that are aqueous solutions and 
they are one on the left and one on the right. And it's these aqueous solutions that split up. And in fact, in a solution of copper sulfate, we don't have copper sulfate particles. What we will have is copper ions that are two plus in their charge and sulfate ions that are two minus in their charge. And the same is true of zinc sulfate, only it will be zinc ions and sulfate ions that the zinc sulfate splits apart into. And anything that is not an aqueous solution doesn't split apart at all. And so when we're considering an ionic equation, we just include them exactly as they were already. Now, if we inspect the ionic equation, we can spot the things that don't change. And here we've got the sulfate ion present on the left and the sulfate ion present on the right. And what the equation shows, remember, is the ingredients, if you like, the reactants on the left-hand side and the products on the right-hand side. And having a chemical on both sides of the equation is the equivalent of having a recipe that said, we're going to make a cake and so we're going to need flour, eggs, sugar and breakfast cereal. And then at the end, we're going to make a cake and some breakfast cereal. And so the breakfast cereal was in the ingredients list, but it was also in the list of the things that you make. So the breakfast cereal hasn't changed. It was there at the beginning and it's there at the end. So we might as well leave it out. And that's the same as an ionic equation. It's there at the beginning, it's there at the end, it hasn't changed, so we leave it out. And so we rewrite an ionic equation without the spectator ions. And not only does that make things a little bit simpler because there aren't so many things in our equation, but it makes it easier to see that the zinc is being oxidised and that the copper is being reduced. So ionic equations, they look a little bit more complicated because they've got their charges for some of the chemicals, but they are simpler in the way that they help us get to the heart of really what's happening in this chemical reaction. We can go through a similar process with the reactions between metals and acids. As you'll remember from a previous video, when acids react with metals, they form metal salts and they release hydrogen gas that you can test for with the squeaky pop test with the lit splint. And these reactions are actually also redox reactions as well, because the metal loses electrons and the hydrogen ions gain them. They are reduced and the metal gets oxidised. Now, from a word equation like that, it's really not easy to see what gets oxidised and reduced. So if we have a look at the word equation with actually the names of more elements in, we can identify more of the elements that are involved. But even better would be to write these as symbol equations where solid magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid that is a solution. And so that's going to split apart. And we make magnesium chloride, which is also a solution, and hydrogen, which is a gas. And to balance the equation, we just need the multiplier 2 in there. Now, if we do the same as before, which is to split apart anything that was aqueous, we can see that the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, is in fact two hydrogen ions that are separated and two chloride ions, because that multiplier that was in front of the HCl is for two hydrogen and for two chlorine. And the magnesium chloride will also split apart and magnesium because it's in group two, it's a two plus ion and chlorine because it's in group seven becomes the chloride ion. But because we had that two in its formula, that means we need two chloride ions separated out. And remember that anything that is not aqueous gets rewritten in the exact same way as before. And now we take a look at this ionic equation and we look for anything that's there at the beginning and there at the end and therefore hasn't changed. And we spot the chloride ions, two at the beginning and two at the end. Well, that's back to this serial idea. We've taken something in our ingredients and we're left with it at the end. So it hasn't changed. And so we get rid of it. And so the ionic equation is written more simply like this format here. And what you can see here is you can track more easily what's happening to each element. So if we look at the beginning, the magnesium has got no charge, whereas at the end, its charge is two plus. And so that means that since electrons are negative, 
magnesium must therefore lose two electrons. And then the hydrogen, which at the end, there's two of them joined together, but together they have no charge, which means that both of the elements must have no charge. But at the beginning, we've got this plus up in the air. So both of them are beginning as one plus ions. And so the hydrogen ions must each of them gain one electron. And so overall, two electrons have been gained. And so this is a redox reaction because the magnesium is giving away two electrons and the hydrogen is taking one and the other hydrogen is taking one. And you can explain that a little bit more clearly maybe with a particle diagram. If you can see here, we've got the magnesium atom with its two electrons in the outer shell. So it is neutral overall at the beginning. And then we've also got our two hydrogen ions, which are both positively charged. Now in the reaction, the magnesium gets oxidized and so the electrons get removed. And so the first electron is given away to one of the hydrogen ions, leaving the magnesium positively charged because of that first loss of a negative electron. And then the second electron gets given away to the other hydrogen ion, leaving the magnesium positive again. So overall, the magnesium has lost two electrons. So it's magnesium two plus. It's been oxidized. And then these two hydrogen atoms have now got a single electron each. And so there are two electrons between the two hydrogen atoms. And those they form the hydrogen molecule, H2, the diatomic molecule. And they use that pair of electrons to form a covalent bond. And so that's why they drift away as bubbles of hydrogen gas. So let's wrap up this video by taking a look at a few questions you could be asked. You could be asked to define oxidation in terms of electron transfer. And then you need to remember your oil rig and reduction is gain, oxidation is loss. And we're looking at oxidation here. So the loss of electrons. You might be asked whether the metal is oxidized or reduced during a displacement reaction. And the key to this is by looking for the zinc at the beginning has got zero charge. At the end, it will be an ion. And so it will be two plus. And so it must have lost negative electrons to become positively charged. Or you might be asked to explain why a particular reaction is considered to be a redox reaction. And that involves very similar logic to in the previous example. The iron at the beginning has got zero charge. At the end, it is two plus. So it has been oxidized. At the beginning, the hydrogen is a positive charge. And at the end, it has zero charge. So it has been reduced. So we've had the reduction of the hydrogen and the oxidation of the iron. And the sulfate is a spectator ion that gets left out. Alternatively, they might ask you to write the ionic equation for this reaction, in which case, remember that the substances that aren't aqueous just get rewritten in exactly the same way. And then the substances that are aqueous split apart into their ions and we leave the spectators out. And so the hydrogen ions are the final reactant and the iron ions are the final product and that's the ionic equation and we've left the sulfates out because they are spectators. Okay that's the end of this video I will see you again soon bye bye